Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy webinar, Disaster in a Crisis Zone, Understanding the Impact of Haiti's Earthquake. My name is Alex Gray, and I am the Director of International Funds at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. My pronouns are he, him, and his. This webinar is co-sponsored by Alliance Magazine, uh, Council on Foundations, Giving Compass, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, and Philanthropy New York. Now, some reminders just before we get started. We are recording this webinar, and it will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is finished. Well, you'll be able to access Zoom created captions today. We will have more accurate captions in the final recording. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box, and we encourage you to do so. And we'll try and answer them at the end of the panel presentation. If you're on Twitter and you want to tweet, then please use the hashtag CDP for the, the number four recovery to share any thoughts and reflections that you might have and uh, to join the discussion. At the end of the webinar, there will be a very short survey We'd love it if you would take a couple of minutes to complete this to help us improve our webinar offerings to better meet your needs in the future. CDP starts all of our webinars with a land acknowledgement to recognize the original stewards of the land where we live and work. I am originally from Scotland, hence the accent, and have lived all over the world, but I currently reside in West Hollywood in California. West Hollywood is part of Los Angeles, which is traditionally known as Tovangar. Although California is home to 109 federally recognized Indian nations, there are none in Los Angeles County, even though we have the largest American Indian and Alaska Native population in the US. The Gabrielino Indians were the first inhabitants of the area known today as the city of West Hollywood. And the name Gabrielino refers to the Uto Aztecan speaking Native Americans who lived throughout the present Los Angeles and Orange County areas. Today, some of the Gabrielino prefer to call themselves by their traditional name, Tongva. These lands were unceded, and the tribes that lived here did not negotiate a treaty with Mexico or the US government. Today, the five Tongva or Gabrielino tribes continue to struggle for their sovereignty. Despite centuries of theft and violence, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Indigenous people are still here today, demonstrating innumerable talents and gifts amid continued oppression and colonialism. We honor the elders, past and present, as well as future generations. I'd like to take a few moments uh, just at the beginning and uh, before we introduce our panelists to give some historical background to the Haitian nation. Um, Haiti is often called the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It has a gross domestic product per capita of just under 1,200 US dollars. There are huge wealth disparities in the country. On the Human Development Index, it had a ranking of 170 out of 189 countries in 2020. And of course, we're all aware of the current political destabilization due to the assassination of President Jovenel Wise. I think it's important to point out and remember that much of this loss of wealth stems from the very beginning of colonialization and the exploitation of land by uh, and people by colonizers, foreign governments, and the elite. Although Haiti was a resource wealthy country at the time it achieved independence on January 1st, 1804, the French independence debt saddled the country and made it impossible to succeed. Haiti's slave revolt marked the first in Latin America and to this day was the only successful modern slave revolt. The resilience of Haiti's people stems from this pride and in independence, despite their many other challenges. But in 1825, France with warships at the ready demanded Haiti compensate France for its loss of slaves and its colony. In exchange for French recognition of Haiti, France demanded the modern equivalent of $21 billion and required Haiti to discount its exported goods to them by 50%. In terms of disasters, uh, Haiti is one of the most at-risk countries for natural disasters in the world, with about 96% of the population at risk of uh, impact. 
There's a history of major earthquakes over the past few hundred years. The one we all remember, obviously, is the January 12, 2010 earthquake in Port-au-Prince that killed 316,000 people, according to the Haitian government, and destroyed over 300,000 buildings, mostly homes. In October, a cholera pandemic began 100 years after it had been eradicated from the island. The epidemic, which led to 820,000 cholera cases and nearly 10,000 deaths by 2019, was actually traced to water contaminated by waste from a UN peacekeeper camp. Hurricane Matthew was a category four hurricane that hit in October, 2016. 1.4 million people needed humanitarian assistance at that time. And there are still people today who are unhoused from these last two major disasters. Now, it's my great honor to introduce our panel members today. And I look forward to the information that they're gonna share with us at this critical juncture and the aftermath of the earthquake and the storm. Karen Keating Ansara is the chair and founder of the New England International Donors, which is a network of 160 grant makers and philanthropists helping to solve global problems. Karen is also a founding board member of the Haiti Development Institute. Pierre Noel is the executive director of the Haiti Development Institute, which he has led for 10 years from its origins as the Haiti Fund at the Boston Foundation through to its transition to an independent organization based in Haiti. HDI supports more sustainable philanthropy in Haiti by supporting the organizational development of Haitian nonprofit organizations and connecting them to funders so that they can lead the development of their own communities. Sebastian Rhodes Stampa is the chief of the emergency response section in the United Nations Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or UNOCHA. Sebastian oversees the response services, including the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination System, Joint Environment Unit, Operational Partnerships Unit, Private Sector Engagements, Connecting Business Initiative Unit, Coordination Platforms, and also serves as the Secretary to the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. Much of his experience over the past decade has been in sudden onset natural disasters, including working in Haiti after Hurricane Matthew in 2016. Mary Rose Roman Murphy is the president of the Fondation Communitaire Haitienne Espoir, that's the Haiti Community Foundation, and founder of Economic Stimulus Projects for Work in Action, or Espoir. Haitian, organ Haitian organizations founded after the 2010 earthquake. Born and raised in Haiti, Marie Rose is a nonprofit strategy management consultant with over 20 years in program development, executive leadership, and nonprofit capacity building. Prior to this, she founded and led two of the first large scale projects focused on meeting the needs of low income Haitian families in the greater Boston area. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for taking time away from your busy work to talk with us today. So, Sebastian, let's start with you. From the point of view of UN OCHA, can you please provide an update on the situation on the ground right now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alex. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. I mean, you know, the, the real tragedy of, of this sort of event is that since that slide was written, the, the numbers have changed. We're looking currently, DGPC, which is the Civil Protection Agency, has given us the latest figures about an hour ago. So 2,189 people are now dead. Nearly 12,300 are injured and another 332 odd are, are, are missing. Um, just to give you an idea of a scale, approximately 650,000 or 40% of the population of the impacted area have been affected. Um, that means, you know, more than 60,000, uh, 60, almost 61,000 homes have been destroyed. 76,000 have sustained substantial damages and that leaves thousands homeless um, and generating that generates in turn pressing needs to provide adequate shelter conditions, access to water, sanitation, hygiene, as well as, as health services. It is a hugely challenging environment to, to work in. Um, it's multi-hazard. Uh, it's characterized by pre-existing displacement, food insecurity, gang violence, which has closed down some of the routes um, which we would normally use to get to the impact there from port au -Prince. COVID-19, uh, not many vaccinated and community transmission is likely when people move into shelters. There's political inst instability, 
Um, and it's additionally complicated by the flooding caused by tropical depression, Grace, which uh, has made search and rescue activities difficult and, and bought landslides. Um, the government and the UN are working hard to improve humanitarian access. Uh, we have a team, it's not 10 persons, which it says there, we have a team of 25 who are currently walking out of Port-au-Prince, Jeremy and Le Cay in the affected area um, to try and assess what, 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 what's going on and, and what we need to, uh, to put down in the affected area. You have to work as close to people as you possibly can. We've put out a business guide. We've shared that, uh, Alex, with CDP, uh, which has references to resources that may be of interest uh, with links to situation reports and assessments. And, and, and I hope you might be able to make that available to the people online. Over. Thank you, Sebastian. We can certainly uh, yeah, pick that up and do that. Um, but build, building on that, uh, do you want to say a few more words about the needs and gaps that you're seeing on the ground? Yeah, sure. Um, needs assessments are in the early stages. I mean, I know it was it was some time ago, but but it really takes a long time to get a very good idea of exactly what's going on. Without any doubt, I think the most important thing at the moment is efficient coordination between the multiple actors present in Haiti. Uh, it's really paramount. Um, and this is why calls like this one are so important. Just to give you an idea, as well as the UNDAC team, we have an EU team. We have search and rescue teams from Colombia, the USA, Germany, France. We have 17 emergency medical teams, which are, uh, um, you know, that they're field hospitals down to small clinics. We, we have endless NGOs. We have civil society. We have private sector through Agoka. We have a lot of people working on this. So coordination is, is really important. We need to continue the immediate search and rescue operations. We've pulled the bags. Well, we have. I mean, the Haitian authorities, aided by some international teams, have pulled about 70 or 80 people from the rubble. Um, it's getting to a stage now, I'm afraid, where we're not going to find many more living. Um, the medical situation is really, really poor. It's probably the most pressing concern. In the, in the area, about 36 hospitals and clinic, clinics have been damaged or completely destroyed. And those that are still operating are completely overwhelmed. They lack sufficient personnel and medical supplies. And we're talking, you know, that they're doing trauma treatment, they're doing emergency referrals for evacuation, they're running out of drugs, they're running out of very, very basic uh, equipment. Thousands are homeless and displaced and in dire need to find shelter and safe environment. We need to provide good water, sanitation and hygiene. Um, I'll be there on Sunday and I'll be looking at that particularly because I, I the, the risk of a cholera outbreak is ever present. What's going to help us all, I think, is early next week, there'll be a flash appeal issued. And this is a tool that the international community use that provides a platform for, for structuring a coordinated humanitarian response to address acute needs for the first three to six months of an emergency. Um, it's led uh, in country by, by the UN humanitarian coordinator, and it's based on assessments to date. And it provides priority projects for humanitarian organizations, UN and NGOs on the ground. It also takes into account the actions and plans of entities not in the appeal, such as the government, which is the main responder, and the Red Cross. And when it's finalized, we'll share a copy with CDP. Uh, and I, I'd encourage any potential funders to consider projects and organizations within that appeal. Um, I think that can really direct the way in, in which you might choose to, to fund the, the much needed response. Over. Thank you for that, Sebastian. Uh, and I just confirmed that uh, the business guide that you referred to is available on uh, our Haiti profile, also on CDP's Haiti profile on the website. Um, Karen, you and your husband have been funding projects in Haiti since before the 2010 earthquake uh, through the Ansara Family Fund. Your focus is one that CDP talks about a lot, getting at the root cause of an issue such as extreme poverty. Um, tell us about the kind of work that you've been doing in Haiti and why you choose those projects. Well, thanks, Alex, and thanks especially for the critically important historical background you provided and Sebastian for your assessments and for hosting this session. Our family's grant making is almost entirely focused on Haiti. My husband, Jim, managed the construction of two major hospitals in Haiti and over 60 other healthcare infrastructure projects there through his nonprofit, Build Health International. And at the same time, I've worked with my Haitian American colleagues in Boston to make scores of grants, including through the Haiti Development Institute and to the Haiti Community Foundation. 
So my experience over the last dozen years or so has underscored what we all know, that disasters strike the poor and the most marginalized the hardest. So we can't respond to a disaster without addressing the underlying deprivations and injustices and without ensuring that citizens' voices are included in the recovery process. And we saw that too often after the earthquake of 2010, poor Haitians became objects rather than agents of their recovery. So with the grant making that we do in Haiti, and our grants are generally small, 10 to $20,000, they have less to do with projects, Alex, and more to do with principles. So as listed here on this slide, we aim to elevate Haitian voices and Haitian solutions while partnering at times with external organizations for technical assistance if necessary. We aim to promote women's agency and leadership because women are key to Haiti's revitalization and they're often extremely marginalized. We fund from the bottom up because local community groups are the backbone of Haitian society. We aim to support networks of Haitian organizations for broad impact, particularly in the agriculture sector because Haiti is primarily an agrarian society. And lastly, we invest in systems change where possible, and namely that is in the health sector. Thank you, Karen, that's, that's great. And uh, you know, these are all principles that you know, we CDP believe in too. So it's really great that you were able to talk to them uh, today for our uh, participants. Um, Pierre, the Haitian Development Institute grew from the Haiti Fund, which was created in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. Uh, you're very active in capacity building, an area that's very important to CDP as well. How will you be supporting local leadership and communities in the next few months or years? Thanks, Alex, and I'm um, uh, happy to uh, join this uh, group of uh, speakers and speak with you. Uh, the thing that I think uh, we, I would like to start with is to place this context. Uh, the earthquake took place in a vastly rural setting outside of a few major city centers that we're talking about. So part of that is for us to acknowledge that uh, we are looking at an Im a deep impact were on a vast population of producers, which was different in 2010. Uh, so with that, you're looking at mountains, you're looking at populations that have been long disenfranchised. How do you actually reach those? That is also why, uh, as uh, Sebastian spoke earlier, it's gonna take a while for us to get uh, real data because uh, vast population have been uh, disenfranchised and on, do, hard to reach. Uh, for us, really, we really believe that uh, there's uh, the opportunity is to build leadership and to be in proximity uh, with communities. So we think moving forward and moving to this response, it should be centered around how do we build local, continue to support local leaders uh, with building, continuing to build their organizations, but also to be part of the relief and recovery uh, process. How do we create space uh, to continue to elevate their voices and to build equity and inclusion in that, in the process that is uh, being shaped? And how do we also help them build uh, confidence in the systems? As you know, uh, mostly Haitians do not have uh, a lot of confidence and trust in existing systems. So, building the capacity of, of partners on the ground to understand that the systems as well as the individuals and institutions are going to be very much important moving forward so that resources can be channeled to support community rebuilding. Thank you, Pierre. <clears throat> These are great, uh, really valid points that um, I hope everyone on the call is bearing in mind when we're thinking about, um, you know, projects and initiatives to fund. Um, Mary Rose, uh, ESPOA and the Haiti Community Foundation were also formed in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. And it looks like you're also very active in capacity building. So a similar question, how will you be supporting local leadership and communities in the next few months or years? 
Um, if I could get the next slide. Um, ESPA stands for Economic Stimulus Projects for Work in Action. And before I forget my manners, I just want to say thank you for being invited. Thank you to uh, everyone who's participating. And um, I'm excited to be here. Um, ESPA means hope in Asian Creole. We've been reconstructing hope in Haitian communities that have long been marginalized for too long. It's a Haiti-led transnational organization. We led the Haiti Community Foundation Initiative to create, and I put it in capital letters, with communities, the Fondation Communautaire Haitienne Espoir, the Haiti Community Foundation, Haiti's first community foundation, Haiti-led, Haiti-based, community-based and community-centered. Um, next slide. Um, and I am on the second slide, but what I want to say is that if you want to think about us as the um, little engine that could, there we were met with a lot of skepticism uh, in terms of our ability to sort of like create and launch the Haiti Community Foundation. Um, I really want to thank some of the believers, and some of them included Karen and Sarah and. Um, Pierre Noel, Pierre André, and uh, the, uh, the Global Fund for Community Foundations and Inter American Foundation. And I can, you know, add a few, but um, the reality is that we were met with a lot of skepticism um, to the extent where people talk about um, their ability in community led initiatives, but <laughs> um, they don't necessarily invest in it. So, when I say no capacity building instead of nation building, instead we want to talk about nation building. Um, I want to put it in a context. Uh, I've been working on Haiti and been involved internationally in a lot of global south networks, international networks, being in localization, you know, forums, very involved, and because the global scene unfortunately has an impact locally. <laughs> and that's also what we're trying to teach our network. And we've been teaching our network. And capacity building is often seen as something that Global North is teaching the Global South. I was three years ago, I was at a localization forum in Geneva. And I basically said, you know, it goes both ways. There is a lot that the Global North can and should learn from the Global South. Um, and there is a certain level of resentment from Global South organizations in terms of this entire concept of capacity building. We can teach someone how to, to fish, but if it doesn't have access to the water, you know, it goes nowhere. And unfortunately, that's been, there's been a lot of that and too much of that. And the reason why, and we talk about capacity reinforcement. The reason why I talk about nation building is because there is a need to invest in ecosystems. So I wanna talk about us as breaking the rules of traditional development and grant making. We adopted a bottom-up and community-led process, okay? Um, we selected a pilot region that was left behind and it was elected. The ground us, you know, is, is, you know, is, is really left behind in Haiti. Um, we did not say that we were coming, we asked if we could come, okay? We did not, we don't believe in short projects. You cannot build a nation with short projects. We went through a very thorough planning process about two and a half years that was really led by regional planning um, committee. Um, and people were wondering, what are you doing? Well, you know, if you have a fragmented society, this is where you start. And many people say there are so many needs you cannot you know, afford to do this. And I basically, we cannot afford not to do this. Um, so that included the, the region's 12 communes at this point they are 13 and hundreds of leaders of all sectors because that that was also part of the process we promised our communities to always work with them we call it tech on some heads together okay and we have never let them down down we have been keeping our promise so grant making is done for communities with communities i think it goes almost beyond what the many people talk about particip participatory grant making next slide Please. What are we talking about the results? We're talking about an unprecedented level of community engagement and support. You have people that have been involved for 11 years and it's not by accident. It's because people could see themselves. You cannot develop people without them. 
You cannot go and dictate what it is. And unfortunately, very often, this is the way it goes. We have a saying in the community foundation, in the Haiti Community Foundation, we say, if you do something without us, you're working against us. So there is a deep sense of pride about our Haitians helping Haitian approach and initiatives that are highly effective and sustainable. Because basically, we're not trying to invent, we're not trying to cookie cutter, to do cookie cutter deals, we're not trying to whatever. We know that there are things happening and we know that the community knows best. So what has resulted as of that, that people were like, what are you doing? Why are we having all these meetings and you haven't raised any money? No, we didn't raise any money. And we did with ten tens of thousands what people with a million something were not able to do. And people were working five hours to make it to meetings. And we were very transparent. At the beginning, we had no money. So what we built a uh, hundred strong regional cost sector or community leaders network that offers a powerful and effective human infrastructure. Why does it matter? Because what it is, it's readiness before, you know, it's proactive development and it's even proactive disaster management. Because you know what happened after Matthew? It mobilized. And we not only ask people about their priorities, and I have a report that I'm happy to share, but we also, we interviewed 240 um, community leaders. We developed an initiative that was focused on, on emergency assistance, but self-sufficiency also. And we call it Le Campé, getting back on your feet. Okay, that focus on people's priorities. Um, so on communities' priorities. Um, is there a next or um, am I not next? I am not sure. <laughs> um, Alex? Yes, I yeah. think you're still next. If you can go to the next slide, please, Roger. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, the, the Haitian diaspora numbers about 2 million people in the US alone. Uh, so Mary Rose, what are you hearing from them that we might not be hearing uh, like on the news, for example? You know, it's very interesting. People talk about the diaspora, the diaspora. I mean, I always talk about Haiti as this magic island. You know, once it sort of like has you under its spell. And by the way, I was you know, born in Haiti. My family goes back to before the independence. Um, but you know, it doesn't let you go. <laughs> so we have an amazingly loyal diaspora. We're talking about four billion in direct giving that doesn't include money that's not going through sort of like official channels. But the diaspora complains because it's like ah, not enough political power and feels like it's being a cash cow. Um, like other stakeholders, they don't know enough about what's going on on the, the ground and they too need hope. Um, as we started this uh, webinar uh, series, because um, after Jovenel's death, we sort of like felt like we had to take control of the narrative. We're sort of like tired, tired of hearing about, you know, Haiti not having the capacity, the big team, the this, the that, because the reality is that people don't know there is so much diversity in terms of what's going on and so many different initiatives. And even the diaspora very often doesn't know. And we had a social change um, webinar on the August 5th that people were just like so excited about. We actually just before this one, we had one on the environment and the wealth of expertise and experience from uh, bio, you know, the, the, the Fonds for la uh, Biodiversité uh, Haitian and, and, you know, the National Trust and the Audubon, La Société Audubon de Haiti, and all of these different things that have been going on in terms of creating reserves and everything else. I mean, people don't know about it. And it's like, we need to invest in a, a ecosystem and even the diaspora, you know, is excited about these things because they do want to invest local. There's a lot of anger, trust me, in terms of what happened about 2010. And you know that's where we're at. And I think that's the message and that's what needs to happen. We need to invest and we need to fund local. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mary Rose. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Pierre, let me ask you the same question. What are you hearing from diaspora and folk? Well, right now, the diaspora is certainly look, uh, feeling and reeling from the loss. Uh, 
as you know, uh, here in the uh, Boston, greater Boston area and general, in general Massachusetts, uh, there's been a groundswell of uh, support uh, where part of uh, conversation meetings that's ongoing in the, the in the uh, around the greater Boston area right now. There's a Massachusetts relief uh, fund that's been created. That's being uh, that effort is being led by HAU Haitian Americans United uh, in the Boston area to actually raise funds and also collect uh, uh, goods and medical care uh, to get to Haiti. Uh, there are plenty of uh, folks in that in the area here who have family and. Uh, they're very much affected uh, by this earthquake. Uh, so uh, the mental effect also is not something that we talk about uh, often, uh, not just in the diaspora, but also in Haiti, considering the uh, continual crisis. Uh, that's another piece that we, as part of our capacity building, work uh, with local leaders and uh, we're working on. The diaspora, certainly wants to be included in the recovery process. There's, uh, uh, I, I was happy to see there's, there, there, there's a call coming up tomorrow uh, to get information from uh, efforts from uh, the US government, uh, but there are plenty that's taking place that the, that the diaspora wants to be included. In terms of building equity, uh, that's, that's important. Uh, the other thing is hometown associations a very powerful tool for development in uh, communities across Haiti. Uh, so there are plenty of hometown associations representing across the diaspora, not just in the US, Chile, uh, Canada, and other places uh, where we have mass populations that are really mobilizing these, these hometown associations are mobilizing to see how they're helping because they represent communities that are affected right now. And some of these, hometown associations, certainly they vary uh, in terms of uh, capacity and uh, impact and history, but, certain, but, but they do a lot in terms of connecting to their community and run, leading projects uh, with uh, and in collaboration with communities uh, in Haiti. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Karen, you're also the founder and chair of the New England International Donors. For many US-based funders who don't fund globally, they struggle with understanding the ins and outs of global philanthropy. So what advice do you have for funders wishing to invest in Haiti's recovery? Sure, well, there are many places that one can look and, and a whole variety of approaches that a funder can follow from both the emergency phase through the long-term recovery and rebuilding stages. So obviously we can invest in intermediary organizations or INGOs with 501c3 status. The ones that can move supplies and first responders quickly, especially in the emergency phase. But the key question to ask them is, how will they put Haitians in the lead and leave Haitian organizations stronger? And that's what we've been hearing from our other speakers too. One can also co-invest with or co-fund with other Haiti funders. At New England International Donors, we have a Haiti affinity group, that, which we'll meet next week, and we'll compare notes <clears throat> and share how we're funding. And at the Haiti Development Institute, we've organized four conferences for Haiti funders over the last 10 years. But again, funders can ask each other, how are you responding and can I join you? Can I rely on your due diligence and on your expertise? Thirdly, we can invest in pooled funds led by experts who do due diligence and make grants like the Center for Disaster Philanthropies Haiti Earthquake Fund. But it's always important to ask when you're funding a pooled fund, who is at the decision-making table and what criteria will they use for the grants? One can look for curated lists of recommended organizations or engage philanthropic advisors with experience in Haiti, tech soup, Women Moving Millions, Fidelity Charitable, the Haiti Development Institute, the Philanthropic Initiative, My Family Fund's website. We all have lists of recommended organizations. Again, one asks, what are the principles behind these recommendations and how have the organizations been vetted? And the last bullet here is something to look for no matter what approach you're using. 
it's important to invest in the right geography. This was, as Pierre pointed out, a regional disaster focused on Haiti's Southern Peninsula. Unfortunately, some organizations that work in other regions of Haiti are raising funds off this disaster. So one needs to ask, will they be channeling all their emergency funding to the affected communities? And the last place, but really the first place to invest is with the diaspora. And that's been talked about extensively already. And that is an approach that I have used as well. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna ask everyone the same question now. Uh, how would you recommend, the question is, how would you recommend funders determine where to invest their financial support? Uh, so Karen, you just spoke about, uh, can we go to the next slide, yes. please? Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, Karen, can you just say a couple of extra sure. words and then we'll move on to the other panelists? Yeah, there, you know, there are just so many areas of need in Haiti. I, I suggest that a funder invest not just in relief, first of all, but in long-term recovery and by choosing a sector where one already has expertise, something that aligns with your current grant making elsewhere. But just as it's important to choose a focus, one also has to be mindful about how one engages in a funder. And so I try to remember that we can't do it all and we can't do it alone. We have to let our grantees teach us and guide us. Actually, in a recent survey done of my grantees, our grantees, um, they said, focus more, focus the grant making on fewer organizations to make them stronger. I also try to remember that we need to work hard to develop trust, knowing trust doesn't come easily. Political discontent in Haiti has been fueled by endemic corruption, as well as by the deep disappointment in the aid efforts after the 2010 earthquake. We can, however, invest in locally rooted organizations and medical institutions that have earned the people's trust. We can support social movements and coalitions that are fighting for a more just society in Haiti, a more trustworthy government, both of which will be essential to the long-term recovery. And lastly, I try to remember not to go away. We just can't go away. There aren't quick fixes in Haiti but there are infinite numbers of incredible Haitian leaders and organizations that have been the glue of Haitian society, both rural and urban for decades. These include vibrant farmer networks, innovative schools, first class hospitals, talented artisan groups, financial inclusion organizations, faith inspired ministries and community development associations and human rights defenders all essential to Haiti's long-term recovery. I have found that you just can't help but fall in love with the people of Haiti if you stay long enough after the disaster. And as Marie Rose has said, Haiti doesn't let you go. Thank you, Karen. I can attest to that myself. I worked a lot in Haiti before oh, uh, the earthquake, uh, so oh. I, I share your sentiments there. Wonderful. Um, Sebastian, what do you think? Same question. How would you recommend funders determine where to invest their financial support? I, I, I think I think my colleagues, the, 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 my, my fellow speakers, have done a, a fantastic job in in in, in guiding. Um, those online, but I, I, I'd say much the same as they have. Support organizations that are already present in Haiti and have a demonstrated track record and go as local as possible and only as international as necessary. You want as much of your um, support to go to local civil society organizations and the like and not to the big international organizations, which you know, simply won't be there that long, that they're, they're, they're funded, they have a job to do. Um, I'd avoid disrupting local markets and supply operations as locally as possible. We work with an organization um, that's part of the Connecting Business Initiative Network in Haiti. It's called the uh, Alliance pour la gestion des risques et la continuité des activités, and that's a JERCA, which coordinates local private sector and civil society and diaspora co contributions within the national disaster management um, framework and coordination mechanism. And Pierre, I think uh, the Haiti Development Institute is a member of a JERCA. Um, that's currently assessing the local private sector resources and capacities that can be mobilized to support response and recovery efforts. And it's really important that we don't just import supplies, but we ensure that we use 
what already exists in country that's going to create opportunities for people in country flying stuff in doesn't do that please remember that local infrastructure and logistics capability could really be very easily overwhelmed by external support especially on an island and that means where you can consider donating cash instead of in kind wherever possible it's more effective it's faster and absolutely critically it gives people the opportunity to make their own minds up about what they want to do to help themselves and their communities um, Coordination is crucial. Um, please ensure that with your implementing partners, the contributions are coordinated with other actors and avoid the provision of unsolicited relief items. We have a principle in the, in the UN, the aid community of do no harm. When you do something, for goodness sake, make sure that you're not actually going to harm the people you're trying to help. Um, if your partners are contributing food uh, and or supplies, please ensure that support meets the critical needs of the affected population. And it's what the civil society and, 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 and civil protection organization ha have asked for. Um, and also, if you're working with a local organization, make sure it has the capacity to store transport and distribute supplies. Um, please make sure your, your partners and in-kind contributions meet humanitarian quality standards. Um, the link is in the business guide, which you've got. This is about not giving people, you know, <laughs> things that drugs that are out of date and, and so on and so forth they may still work but but these people deserve the very best that we can provide them and we've got to try and do that and karen pierre and mary rose have all talked about accountability and inclusion you need to have all projects have to have community feedback and transparency mechanisms in place you need to engage and involve the people um, who you'd like to help in the, in, in the projects that that, that 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 will you know that will assist them they need to be part of that um, look, in finishing, I just want to sincerely thank you all for your support for the Haiti response. It is a, it is a marvelous country, um, but your support is critically needed. And if you, if you need any more information from us, I'm going to post a, an email address in the, in the chat. Um, and that's my, my lead staff member on, on this. And I'll be going there, as I said, on tomorrow I leave. Um, so I'll be out of touch for a bit, but I'll be back and, and happy to answer any questions or, or, or do anything else we can do. Over. Thank you, Sebastian, for that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Pierre, can you add your thoughts to this discussion? Sure. Uh, you know, the thing that I think I want to emphasize uh, again is uh, the local uh, context. Uh, we're talking about, a about an Im impact in vast rural settings. So one of the things that's going to be important for funders is to understand that Yes, right now there's a there's a huge need for the humanitarian support right now, but as much as you can possibly do is think about rebuilding livelihoods as fast as possible, getting infrastructure, getting machines to remove uh, not only wobbles but also to clear irrigation canals and other things that would really go directly to support uh, the rural setting and getting life back uh, moving in those communities. Uh, you know, we work uh, currently with about 20 organizations that has been uh, through our capacity building program to build effectiveness around financial management and everything that you can think of for an organization and work with Ajurka to help us with training for local leaders and local organizations around disaster management. Uh, but the most important thing is, as a funder and as a donor, how do you understand how to get out of your way to, to help build what you sometimes realize you cannot do, but is the need that actually exists? For example, right now, we need to think about the long term. Haiti is prone to disasters. How do we get to thinking about creating institutions that would stay beyond uh, this response that would help the next disaster because we know they, 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 there will be more. The other thing also is, so with that, for example, it could be how do you contribute to a fund, a disaster relief fund, instead of direct uh, or in addition to direct support for existing uh, needs right now, how do you think about capacity building uh, development fund? Because local organizations, there's a groundswell for the last 30 years of local organizations, farmer organizations, women organizations that have been leading their communities to development. Right now, the trust they've gained in their community 
we do not want to actually lose that. And the only the one way we could lose that is if this response that's coming in right now actually bypasses them. If it does, these organizations will be set back 10, 20 years. And also what we will see is the impact will be uh, felt in the community for the long term because it will not only increase local uh, harm the local economy, but it will also increase the life, the, the cost of life in those communities for the, for the long term. So again, I would say, I would support what uh, everyone has ha has been saying. Look for how you can work through intermediaries with local cultural competency and understanding of also the reach that already exist and the reach that these organizations have already been working in their communities and support through them. I think that's the that's the that would be the way forward right now. And and donors would do themselves uh, along uh, in terms of would do themselves would help themselves quite a bit if we follow these these rules moving forward uh, with the response. Thank you, Pierre. And last but not least, Mary Rose. Well, um, my recommendations at this point, um, I, I think I really thank um, everyone for uh, their recommendations. Um, my recommendation is to think long-term, short-term projects don't be a nation. Um, you know, systems, uh, including local judiciary organizations. Um, and I keep saying that I've been involved in a lot of different sort of like webinars and forums. And I say aid should be about ending the need for aid. And I, I repeat it, aid should be about ending the need for aid. So I think if we think about it that way, and it doesn't matter if it's 10 or 20 years or whatever, we have to think exit strategy. Um, I wrote an article, I quote an article with Digon Ali where we, we talked about some of these things that we need to do to, in order to do structural change. And I realize that it's going to put all of us out of a comfort zone, but I think it's imperative that we think that way. Um, so, you know, I would encourage, and I've said that to a group of European funders, take some risk. Sometimes all you need is a leap of faith. There's a lot of, you know, hesitancy and a lot of worries and I mean, the thing is that the thing, the wonderful thing about philanthropy, you know, it's like it has flexibility and it can fund innovation. And um, think community first, community organization, community groups, community staff, community investment. Um, the next slide, please. Um, the other thing is that take the time to know the field. Nothing is instant and it's okay to make mistakes. Um, and the, the thing is that I realize that it's very interesting because for me, it's like I see a lot of very liberal and progressive people. And, you know, the reality is that it's not so much thinking about, you know, out of the box, it's sometimes creating a new box. <laughs> um, you, a lot of people think about investing in grassroots organization and small organization as being very progressive and liberal. And trust me, I believe where we work with a network of small organizations that are not on the radar, but, you know, you are going to be missing opportunities. Some of these people that have, are, have been and will be invested, like uh, involved in the webinars that I'm showing, sort of like show you the values level and the richness and diversity of the ecosystem. For example, one of the things that I will tell you is that also there are local funders and I just feel like there need to be sort of like connection. Um, I've been talking over the past three days, but with Fondation Social Bank, with Michelle Taylor, the president, and who's being approached by some international, you know, international foundations. And he's talking about, you know, federated effort and he wants the Haiti Community Foundation to lead the, not only the disaster, but the recovery piece. So we've been talking about sort of like the steps that are necessary, what, because we're on the ground already, but, you know, it's essential for us. And there's also the Grand Foundation IT, which is an umbrella um, organization where you have a number of uh, local foundations in Haiti, uh, including sort of like uh, 
national trusts, including uh, the Fondation des Champs, you know, including Fondation Solge Bank, including, you know, us, the Haiti Community Foundation. And we are trying to coordinate the effort. There's, an effort to, there's a meeting tomorrow where our, our vice president is going to be there because we just sort of like realized the need for collective action and for the building of the ecosystem and for us to frankly lead the way. So invest and we welcome anyone who wants to sort of like invest to the extent where, yeah, let's talk and let's see how we can channel all of that and leverage what's there that you may not know is there, but is there. So invest in foundational work and reinforcing the local, regional and national network. A society is only as strong as its networks. You know, it's very interesting going back and forth and working in different parts of the world. I mean, Haiti, the US and other parts. And it, it's very, because the US has had the amazing and, you know, Canada and, you know, Europe, they've had the privilege to have, uh, you know, a very active philanthropic sector, like a hundred plus years old. And there's a lot that's taken for granted. The problem is that we're often prisoners of ourselves. And we don't realize what a support it is to have this kind of infrastructure. And we tend to sort of like think, oh, but this is what we're supposed to have. We have to be careful about Western centric uh, approaches and to realize that there is, if, if there are expectations, I mean, there needs to be some support in terms of the expectation. This is not the US, it is not the US, it is not Canada. And there's a need for flexibility, there's a need for co-creation, and there's a need for long-term investment and support. So I hope that you, you will consider that and you'll be curious enough to find out about some of the players that are there, um, that are at various levels, grassroots, intermediary, and everything else. Thank you. Alex, I don't know Thank if you. I have another thing. I think that's Thank it. you, Mary Rose. That's great. I mean, lots of fascinating and very uh, relevant points. And I think, you know, uh, you know, particularly from my point of view, the uh, and the audience on this call, uh, you know, just highlighting that point that you know philanthropy can be flexible, and um, you know, taking risks is the other one. I I really like that. You know, philanthropists can take risks that perhaps institutional government donors can't. Um, so I think that's really important to remember. And so, I mean, we have a few minutes for a question and answer. So thank you everyone for sending in your questions and answers. I'll try, if we can, uh, I'll, I'll direct them at the panelists and hopefully if you can just keep your answers short, we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, maybe, uh, so I have a question here um, that was sent in earlier. What has been done since the last earthquake in terms of emergency preparedness, education and training? And maybe I'll give that one to Pierre. Thanks, Alex. Uh, well, on our end, uh, we've been uh, working uh, through our capacity building work with uh, community organizations. Um, and through our work, one of the, one of the uh, as part of our curriculum, we, we, we have a partnership with Ajerka that uh, comes in and also does the training for community leaders. Uh, and also we have uh, not only a community organizations, but also we've been to, to organizations each, in each community where we work, we try to also build and identify people, the stakeholders on the, on the public uh, side. Uh, so we organize uh, meetings and trainings for uh, Kazakh and Azex uh, and uh, local mini municipalities. That way, uh, we have uh, we we build the capacity at that level as well to uh, so that there's there's a bit more uh, alignment with respect to what uh, the community leaders as well as uh, the leaders uh, the the public leaders understand uh, the work is. Um, we do we do actually uh, have uh, connections uh, with uh, other organizations uh, uh, civil protection is one uh, is one uh, area that has been where capacity has been built there's a bit more organization at that level uh, at the at the at that unit 
if you would remember, if for those who do not know, uh, a civil protection unit is a part of the Ministry of the Interior, and uh, they've been uh, somewhat uh, supported quite a bit, and they're pretty much uh, active in every single uh, activities that goes on in those across the country. Um, not only uh, with disasters, but pretty much they're, they're very, very much active. And uh, the, the only thing is uh, with respect to that is how do we partner not with the public sector? Because uh, we understand in every community there has to be civil society, public sector, and the private sector all to be engaged and aligned in order to actually bring capacity and also uh, provide uh, solutions. Uh, so that partnership, I would hope uh, with, uh, as time goes on, it's enabled and uh, we're able to really develop a community systems uh, for this response. Thanks, Pierre. Um, so I'm just doing a time check. and I, I, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions today, but hopefully we've been able to answer some of them in the Q&A box. Um, and I'll, and I'll come on in a moment uh, to, to address some of the other ones. So um, as I said, that's all the time we have for questions, but as we begin to wrap up, I just wanna take a couple of minutes to provide the audience with some key takeaways from our conversation. So we had this humanitarian principle of as local as possible and as international as necessary, um, you know, that Sebastian shared with us. And I think that's very important to remember. We want to rely on local knowledge and capacities we want to reinvigorate the local economy as much as possible. And importing goods, uh, especially to an island, can be very expensive or, or even inappropriate. And you know, we, we saw a question there about when uh, you know, it, can, it can result in inflation and, and some warning signs to, to look for there. Um, so, but you know, I think a key point is you know, if things exist uh, locally, um, then rely on them there. And uh, if not, bring them in, but think consciously uh, about it. Uh, another uh, kind of key takeaway, I guess, from, from our panelists was that, first of all, find and then fund local leaders and networks. And if you're funding an American-based 501c3, find out who their Haitian partners are and ask about how they're supported. You know, what is the proportion of Haitians to international staff on the team, for example? It's critical to value and uh, elevate and empower local voices and local leaders and equip them with the resources that they need to lead their own country. Uh, we also heard a lot about investing in an ecosystem and the systems and networks. And as Mary Rose said, it should be about ending the need for aid. I, 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 really, I really like that. And it's something I'm gonna take forward uh, and use myself. This means taking the wide view and looking at all the sectors of a society and remembering that even though we're in the acute relief phase, taking the long view uh, as well and remembering that you're in a marathon, uh, but it's still a race. You know, it's, it's important that funders invest in midterm and long term recovery. You know, people were still homeless before this recent earthquake, not just from uh, Hurricane Matthew in 2016, but from the 2010 earthquake. That shouldn't be the situation 11 and a half years after a disaster. And it's not what we want to see when we look forward to 2032. Uh, but just again, acknowledging that at the same time, there are immediate, acute and essential basic needs that require uh, immediate emergency funding. CDP has a mountain of resources devoted to disaster philanthropy that can help you out. Um, this includes several funds to support response and long-term recovery activities, including our newly launched Haiti Earthquake Recovery Fund. Uh, our issue insights provide an introductory look at disasters and responses and, and some of the issues around them. There are recordings of all of our past web webinars that you can view. Our disaster profiles provide regular information about the impact of a particular disaster and the needs of the community so that it can inform philanthropy on how they can help. And there's a monthly newsletter full of useful and interesting information. And CDP staff are always available to provide guidance if you need, a more, if you need more in-depth assistance. We also provide a variety of consulting services. And you can find more information about CDP's work at disasterphilanthropy.org.
To those of you who may be planning disaster response funding, CDP has many additional resources and information in the Disaster Philanthropy Playbook, and you can find it at disasterplaybook.org. Uh, please join us at CDP on September 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar, COVID 19's Long Tail Developing a Mental Health Strategy for Recovery. Uh, in order to respect everyone's time and keep this to an hour, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's webinar. But um, I thank you to our co sponsors Alliance Magazine, Council on Foundations, Giving Compass, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters and Philanthropy New York. And a very, very special thanks to Pierre, Karen, Mary Rose and Sebastian for taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules, especially at this time, to share their insights with us. If you have any questions or thoughts that were not addressed during today's webinar, you can email them to tanya at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day.